is intraventricular hemorrhage. Hey, I'm Amanda. I'm a neonatal clinical nurse specialist, and this is my YouTube series talking about some of my most popular posts on Instagram. And today we're talking a little bit about IVH, intraventricular hemorrhage. This is one of my favorite topics to talk about because I just love that small baby population and that developmental care. So first things first, what is IVH or intraventricular hemorrhage? IVH is basically when there's a bleed that occurs in the ventricles of the brain. So the ventricles are part of the place where cerebral spinal fluid or CSF circulates in the brain. So the ventricles are connected to the chorid plexus and that is where CSF or cerebral spinal fluid is kind of produced and it comes up into the ventricles and it circulates from the lateral ventricles down into like the third and fourth ventricle and it, it does this whole circulation. We're not going to talk about that right now, but we're going to talk about intraventricular hemorrhage. So who gets IVH? Who gets intraventricular hemorrhage? The babies who are at highest risk are babies who are born premature. So babies who are born less than 32 weeks specifically. And the reason why is because babies who are born less than 32 weeks gestational age, they have this fetal structure still present called the germinal matrix. The germinal matrix is a structure where neurons germinate and proliferate and then they kind of grow to create the cortex of what is our brain. And that structure is extremely vascular, extremely fragile, and it's full of all these little um, vessels that help with that proliferation of neuronal cells. What can happen when babies are born very early, and the earlier they are born, the more at risk you could think they are, is that those very fragile vessels, they can easily rupture or bleed. And there's a lot of things that put babies at higher risk of intraventricular hemorrhage. So some things occur prenatally, like chorioamnionitis infection can increase the risk. Any kind of hypoxic ischemic event will increase the risk because the body is going to try and redistribute blood flow to the brain to protect it as one of the most important organs. So that increases the risk of intraventricular hemorrhage. Some other things that increase the risk of intraventricular hemorrhage are certain types of medications that we might provide, like sodium bicarbonate. Sodium bicarbonate increases the osmolarity, which increases the risk of bleeding as well. Now, there's different things to think about when it comes to the germinal matrix and how we care for babies in the NICU or even before they reach the NICU. So there's some ways that we can try to prevent intraventricular hemorrhage from happening. So for one, in prenatal care. So providing antenatal corticosteroids has shown to help decrease intraventricular hemorrhage, as well as antenatal management of chorioamnionitis. Management of chorioamnionitis also has shown to decrease the risk of intraventricular hemorrhage. Now when the baby is born, there's some really important things that we do to also decrease the risk of hemorrhage. So maintaining thermoregulation is one providing delayed cord clamping to ensure that that baby gets all of that blood flow from the placenta, that they're not deprived and hypovolemic. That decreases intraventricular hemorrhage, as well as having an experienced delivery room team, not having multiple attempts at intubation, for example, if intubation is needed. All of those skills and team dynamics are super important in preventing morbidities like intraventricular hemorrhage. And then there's other things that we do in the NICU every single day to decrease the risk of intraventricular hemorrhage. Overall, we're thinking about decreasing fluctuations in cerebral blood flow. You and I, we could do cartwheels down the hall and the blood flow to our brain would remain relatively stable. But very small, very premature babies they don't have that auto-regulation. They can't regulate the blood flow to their brain. And so small things like when you're changing their diaper, if you lift up their legs above their head or above their hips, that can cause a sudden influx of blood flow or a really fast flush or a really fast withdrawal of blood from an arterial line. 
When you think about the germinal matrix, this fetal structure that is still present for our preterm babies, it has a vessel in it that's shaped a little bit like a bobby pin. So when we're providing this sudden increase of volume or this sudden flow, it kind of reaches this U-turn or this dead end where if it's going too fast or we're not thoughtful about how we do that, then we can invoke bleeding. And that is not what any of us want. There's a lot of other things that we do to try and reduce intraventricular hemorrhage from maintaining midline head positioning with the thought process that when a baby's head is turned from one way or another, that it actually reduces vascular return back to the heart. Now, another way you can think about it is having your head turned like this for four hours, six hours, however long, is not very comfortable. And so also just comfort in that part. In all transparency, the data around midline head positioning is kind of limited. It's very much in combination of bundles that we do at the bedside to prevent IVH. So it is not in and of itself the lone piece that reduces intraventricular hemorrhage, but it is good to think about and it is good to be mindful of the position of the baby's head. The other thing we want to think about is just how we're handling the babies and how we're supporting the babies during care times when we're doing our exams and our assessments and changing their diapers. Their vestibular system is very immature and so turning them needs to be very slow and gentle. A quick flip, when I was a new grad this is called the preemie flip, and now we know that babies can feel dizzy, they can feel unwell for up to 30 minutes before they feel better from that, that their immature vestibular system and that kind of preemie flip. So we wanna ensure that we're slow and thoughtful in our movements. And also, again, thinking of the sensory system, we wanna provide positive sensory support. So encouraging families to be there to do hand hugs and give skin to skin whenever they are able to based on your institutional policies. That is really the most positive sensory support we can give to small babies is putting them skin to skin with their parents. There are different grades of IVH based on severity. So Volpe and Papil, Papil, Papile. I'm never sure if I'm saying names right when I'm just reading them, <laughs> but there's two different grading systems that look at severity of IVH. So grade one typically being a germinal matrix hemorrhage where it's just confined to that space within the germinal matrix. Grade two meaning that it is starting to fill into the ventricles, but the ventricles are not dilated and it's less than 50% of the ventricles. Grade In grade three, the ventricles are starting to become dilated and there may be 50% or more of the ventricles filled with blood. And at that point, we're starting to worry about things like hydrocephalus. Grade four used to be thought of as essentially the blood escaping the ventricle into the parenchymal space. However, now many people are thinking that it's a completely separate type of injury where there is bleeding in the parenchyma, but it's not overflow from the ventricles is its own, it's its own bleed. Some of the management that we do when we have a baby who's been diagnosed with an IVH is serial head ultrasound. So we want to monitor the bleed and see how it's progressing. The blood will be reabsorbed, but blood on the, on the ventricle, in the brain, it's caustic to the tissue. It's not without harm to it. And we want to see that the, the bleed is not getting larger, for one. Um, other things that we may look at are AEEG or EEG to look for seizure activity because that blood on the tissue can kind of evoke this, this abnormal firing, so to speak. So we could see seizure activity. So we would look at EEGs and AEEGs for that. And if there is grade three or higher, or there's signs of hydrocephalus, post-hemorrhagic hydrocephalus, then surgical intervention may be necessary. Babies may get a reservoir to help capture the excess cerebral spinal fluid, or eventually they may even get a ventriculoperitoneal shunt, which shunts the excess cerebral spinal fluid to the peritoneal space. I hope this was a helpful review for you on intraventricular hemorrhage. Be sure to like and follow for more of these videos reviewing some of my 
hot topics from my Instagram page. I hope you enjoyed and I look forward to seeing you. If you also are looking for more education, check out my neonatal certification course. It's for NICU nurses who are looking to become certified with their RNC, NIC, or their CCRN. I would love to have you there. Take care. Have a wonderful rest of your day.